Hello, my name is Genevieve Gaunt and I'm an actress. I read English at Newnham and I'm here today to read a story to you as part of the virtual visit. I'm reading from my flat in London and I am joined by my kitten Bluebell. I hope she, she behaves herself. Um, this is a, a children's short story collection called The Land of Play. It was published in 1906 by, well, it was published under the name Mrs. Graham Wallace, uh, but we can call her Ada. And it was gifted to Newnham College Library by her daughter, May Wallace, who also attended Newnham and became a professor of modern and medieval languages. The story I'm going to read today is called Professor Green, and it's about a doll's house and the characters, i.e. the dolls, that live in that house. <clears throat> Chapter One. The Professor's Home Life. At the large writing table in the room that extended over the first floor of Mimosa Lodge, Professor Green sat writing. He was warmly but rather shabbily dressed in a suit of brown velveteen. His blue eyes were so short-sighted that his fair head, with its one flat rolling curl, lay almost on the table, while one outstretched arm rested on his manuscript. At the top of the paper was written, History of the Universe, by Professor Green. No smaller subject would have satisfied him. In its largeness he found comfort and forgot his surroundings and the difficulties of his daily life. Absorbed as he was, he did not hear a word of the conversation that was being carried on by three ladies who sat on the chintz-covered sofa at the back of the room. Mrs. Green and her friends, Mrs. Nutt, the wife of the chauffeur, and Mrs. Breeze, the wife of the sea captain, were discussing, as they often did, the claims of the new and the old in Doll's House Land. The twins, Minerva and Hebe Green, one in blue and one in pink, played about at their mother's feet. The ladies talked of motor cars. Mrs. Green did not like to say before Mrs. Nutt how much she preferred the old-fashioned horse carriage, but when the conversation turned on diet, she expressed herself with much firmness. Certainly, she said, the two purplish fish, mackerel glued to their dish, and the dark blue bunch of grapes, also immovable, were far more satisfactory, and she believed nourishing than the biscuit and sugar and hot messes which had become of late the fashion among children to supply them with. Meanwhile, Professor Green wrote on. It was fortunate for him that Mrs. Green cared about the diet question and the warming of the house and the well-being of the twins. His was a life of thought. The calling ladies did not venture to address him, but they stuck to their seats as if they never meant to leave. At last, Peggy, the little servant, entered carrying the simple old-fashioned supper loved of the Greens. It consisted of the two fish on their chocolate-coloured plate, the blue grapes, and those convenient glasses of wine in which you could see the pleasant red fluid moving about, but which could not be spilt. The visitors now saw that it was time to be off and left hurriedly. Peggy, a good soul but a little untrained, dropped all the things on the table on the top of a pile of papers and went back to the kitchen. Still, the professor wrote on, and there, an hour later, Mrs. Green, having tucked in the twins, found him. Without a word of reproach, she urged him to eat, and as they took their supper together, she realised afresh the advantages of their old-fashioned dishes. These fish had been in the family for years, and they were not hurt by waiting a little for an absent-minded master. After his supper, the professor strolled onto the balcony and looked out into the world beyond. It was a lovely evening in spring, and he gazed through the French windows of the children's nursery at the lawn in the garden outside. Good evening, Professor, said a voice that he knew. The Professor's eyes shone with pleasure. The voice was Diana's, and a talk with her was one of his few treats. 
It hurts no dull self-respect to admit that he is in a sense the property of another. The more thoughtful the doll, the more ready he is to acknowledge this. But the owner should endeavour to understand the character over which he rules. She should, as the professor had often said to his wife, distinguish between doll and doll. The Green family had only lately come to Mimosa Lodge from Dublin, where the professor had held the history chair at Trinity College. Fortunately, they could live on their savings, for they were a frugal couple, and the professor could devote himself to writing his History of the Universe. They had never regretted the move, and this, the professor realised, was largely because of the sympathetic understanding that existed between him and Diana. A similarity of tastes rather than of interests, for Diana was still only a child, drew them together. She too, the professor found, cared for books. Her first anxiety was to see that he had plenty, as well as weekly and monthly historical journals and reviews, like those on the table in Diana's father's study. She did not subject the family to incessant spring cleanings, regardless of the season, as their previous owner Sylvia had done. She appreciated the practical qualities of Mrs Green. In domestic matters, acknowledging her greater age and experience, she deferred to her opinion, just as in intellectual things she deferred to the professor. She thought of their comfort in every possible way. She introduced Mr and Mrs Breeze and Mr and Mrs Nutt that they might have friendly neighbours. She knew that the Breezes and the Nuts were not the Greens' equals, but she felt that a man who was writing the history of the universe would not be narrow-minded. And she was right. The professor had been at Mimosa Lodge for a month, and he and Diana had never had a difference of opinion, so that when he heard her cheerful, Good evening, he leant over the balcony, prepared for a pleasant talk. We have, he said, a beautiful outlook from Mimosa Lodge. I'm so glad it pleases you, said Diana. Do tell me, Professor, is there anything that I can do for you? Have you everything that you want? Oh, really, you are very kind, he murmured. You have already had so much to do in settling us in. Not at all, said Diana. It was a pleasure. Do tell me, she begged if there's anything on your mind. She hoped very much as she spoke that he would ask for something that was within her power to provide. There is a thing that would be most useful to me in my work, he began. Oh, do tell me what it is, she said. If only it's something that a little girl can get. Do not trouble for a moment if it is impossible, he answered kindly. It is... A map of Britain at the time of the Roman occupation. Diana jumped onto her feet and exclaimed joyfully, How very strange! That's exactly the thing I've been doing in my history lesson with Mr. Wint. I'm so glad you mentioned it. I can make you a small one in a very short time. The professor, encouraged and delighted, ventured to express another darling wish. A life like mine... He began. Yes, said Diana encouragingly. A life like mine, he went on, is seldom led, or or perhaps I should say, is led under difficulties without a waste paper basket. Of course, of course, exclaimed Diana. It was really stupid of me not to have thought of it before. Why, my daddy has an enormous one, and it's nearly always full. Only two days later, when the professor settled to work, on the wall opposite his chair was the map of Britain pinned firmly up with drawing pins, and by the side of the table where he wrote was a waste paper basket. These attentions made him very happy. It is true that the map of Britain at the time of the Roman occupation had not much detail in it, but, as the professor said, you did not want physical features in a map of that kind. The waste paper basket was so large that it would comfortably have housed the Professor and Mrs Green, the twins and Peggy. But, as Mrs Green said, it was for use and not for ornament. She looked around the room with pride. Her husband's wish was fulfilled. In spite of a piano and a sofa covered in pink and blue chintz, in spite of a china clock under a glass shade, 
In spite of a waxy-looking parrot in a gilt cage, the front first-floor room of Mimosa Lodge was a study. For no one can call a room in which the main features are a map of Britain and a waste paper basket a drawing room. And that is the end of that chapter. It's been a real pleasure being involved in this virtual visit and I hope you have a wonderful um, end of the day. Um, this is goodbye from Bluebell and, and, and me. And um, thank you.